Hello and welcome to the Southbound Sports Show. I'm your host, Richie Leahy, here with my co-host, Matty B. And um, before we get started here, I'm going to make an announcement that we're going to be officially moving our podcast to Spotify, something that's been in, work, in the works for a while, but we had to get some kinks um, ironed out. If you, if you use the archive.org link to listen to the show, because we know some people do, uh, based on the numbers there. That's still going to be up. I'm going to kind of use that as the backup. But for people that like to stream it in the browsers, I know there's been issues with the hosting, and it just doesn't make sense for us to try to figure that out when uh, Spotify had an offer that we could just go ahead and use their um, online player. So everything else should be the same. I think it's the same link on iTunes and Amazon. I think the Google podcasting went away anyway. Uh, someone told me it might be shifting the YouTube podcast or something. I don't know if there's a video component. We already kind of do the show on YouTube every Tuesday at 9. So if you just want to watch it there, you can go ahead and watch it live. Maybe we'll just publish them. Um, I think I don't even know if they're unlisted after we do it. But maybe I'll put a link somewhere. I don't know what I'm going to end up doing there for the YouTube one. We'll wait and see, I guess. But make sure... Um, if you're not getting them to let me know, everything's redirects are already in place. So this this episode will be the first one. So if you're hearing it, you're good to go. Um, let's see what else. Oh, before I I did the show notes or after I did the show notes, um, Florida State's lawsuit in Florida didn't get thrown out basically. So they were trying to get the lawsuit to be heard in North Carolina. Now there's going to be a fight, from what I understand, between the state of Florida and North Carolina to do the ACC. So the ACC's lawyer down in Florida was one of their like head Supreme Court previous justices or something. I don't know. And so he was really hoping that they would just throw it out. They would hear it in North Carolina. But the fact that the state of Florida is behind Florida State is very key because the ACC still has like contracts that are trade secrets, which doesn't make any sense because like it's a contract, right? What's the trade secret? There's a blackout. I can't watch the game anyway, <laughs> which is, is, is my lead in because like I was very impressed. I, I've been complaining about some of the local blackouts and how ESPN now. If you have ESPN Plus, which comes with like the Hulu Disney Plus bundle, I think that's how I have it. In the past, if a game was on ESPN, you couldn't stream it. And so now, I know I brought it up last week that the women's basketball game was on ESPN. I couldn't stream it. This past weekend, they went all in, and it was just like the, the Michigan hockey game. I could stream it. I didn't have to pay for ESPN. It was on both. And it's very clear that they're adding those numbers together with the traditional TV broadcast whenever they announce the women's basketball thing. But I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on the Florida State thing, Matt. Do you think, because some of the articles I was looking at right before the show, they think that Florida State is going to be announcing soon that with this lawsuit, they're going to be able to leave the ACC. Do you feel like that's going to happen soon? Or do you think it's going to be kind of a wait and see how the rest of this goes? I I really just have a gut feeling that it's going to happen sooner rather than later because I don't think both the ACC and ESPN, for that matter, they don't want to put themselves in a spot where they have to start exposing the details of their contracts and the, the way that they're structuring some of these deals because it essentially was too... ESPN and the ACC's advantage the way that they had structured everything and I, I just think they don't want to they want to avoid the bad publicity that's going to go along with a long dragged out court case I think the I think the bet the win-win in this is get a number that's reasonable let Florida State buy out settle with Clemson, let them buy out, and then you still have enough 
conference people that you can fill those spots taken by Florida State and Clemson and probably you know the the other speculated teams that want to try to leave and still maintain the integrity of the conference. Like you don't want it to end up being a situation like what happened with the Pac-12 where people started bailing and then it just leaves the conference completely blown up. And I think they want to try if you want to try to keep the conference intact and maintain all those those main corporate level positions in North Carolina, the way you, you maintain the conference revival is even if two of your bigger horses leave, you still get enough people to maintain the integrity of the conference. And that's where I think down here with NC State's run to the Final Four, I, I a lot of eyeballs were on NC State. I think I saw the numbers where most of the crowd in Phoenix was NC State, where Alabama didn't have a lot of people there, and they specifically called out UConn didn't have a lot of people because UConn just won the national championship last year. So, And they said last year they didn't have a lot of people either, which leads to the the rumor that like no one wants UConn because there's no fan support. Yeah, they can win, um, and they can keep winning, be a blue blood or whatever, but if you don't have the fan support to support football, no one's going to care. Like, no one wants to watch you get your face beat in in front of nobody, right? I mean, that's, that's the argument, like, about Rutgers, too. It's like, when are they getting better? And I know they didn't get the full cut of the pie, but it's like, just get people there. Like, if you're not playing Ohio State or Michigan and they're filling the stadium with their fans, then w- what's the difference? But with NC State, I feel like with them making the Final Four and seeing their fans travel, I wouldn't be surprised... And um, I'm trying to think of how to put this delicately. I wouldn't be surprised if I, if some people panicked, almost like West Virginia, where when the Big East was about to implode, West Virginia's like, we're going to the Big 12. And everyone's like, really? It doesn't really make sense. And I wonder if we're going to see a repeat of that with NC State. Where if, because there's been some rumors recently that the Big 10 might might be willing to take both Clemson and Florida State. I'm wondering if that's because North Carolina is getting cold feet or if they're kind of waiting to see. I told you with the NCAA tournament coverage, there's been a lot of media push to keep the ACC together. Clemson and Florida State don't really have that connection where Duke and UNC do. And I almost wonder if Clemson and Florida State leave and it doesn't look like UNC is going to go right away. If NC State waits, the Big Ten might never offer them. And they don't want to be into an Oregon State or Washington State position, right? Where if North Carolina decides to go to the SEC, and that's where NC State has been planning it to fall, they might just get out ahead and say, you know what? Big 12 basketball is probably better. Let's just go there. (laughs) Uh, They've won recent national championships more so than the Big Ten. Heck, the last two Big Ten basketball championships were Michigan State in like 2000. And then Michigan in 1989 with Glenn Rice. Like insane that they can't win another one. I know Michigan's been back. Michigan State's there. Purdue was just there. Wisconsin's been there. But you got to win in the championship game. Uh, They've had like the worst luck. I think they're like 0-8 or something like that. And so like NC State looking at that and saying like, what if they don't want us? Like if they take Clemson and Florida State, the Big Ten, maybe they don't need North Carolina. Clemson grabs mo- much of the the Charlotte area. If they were to grab like Virginia, do they need a North Carolina team? And what if they grab Duke or something weird? At NC State, I'm telling you, they there might be some panic and they're one of the teams named. And uh, another one would be Virginia Tech. Don't be surprised if you have like a an Appalachian type pod in the Big 12 where it's like West Virginia, Virginia Tech, NC State... And maybe a pit or something like that. Don't be surprised. I'm just putting that out there. Um, so you heard it here first. I'm not saying there's ongoing discussions. I just know that things are being discussed. And so you don't want to be left behind. And if the Big 12 move happens first, it's going to be hard to get them afterwards. And the reason I brought up West Virginia is West Virginia jumped to the Big 12. The ACC had an opening. They grabbed Pitt. And they wanted West Virginia to come, and they were like, look, 
You didn't want us a year ago or whenever we really needed you. We're going to stay in the Big 12 and then the ACC had to take Louisville. And maybe that hurt the conference because like, if they would have been able to grab West Virginia and kept a football focus and not just brought in another basketball school. I don't know Louisville's had football success, but it's a different beast now. So let's wait and see because I've been under the assumption that no one wants Clemson because their footprint's small. They do have support. Maybe if Florida State's working with them, though, and the Big Ten sees it as the way and North Carolina's giving them cold feet because of this ACC push, and UNC is stubborn enough to kind of stay, right, and just let the ship sink. Why not take the big two football powers from the ACC and leave them practically as a they're as like a walking dead conference? Like if we're being honest, they're walking dead. There's no way the Big 12's rumored to be looking at UConn. If they were to grab UConn, I, I I don't even know why they would, other than just basketball and the women's and men's team. But like I said, they're not bringing football support at all. They would just be a team that's going to get beat down. And maybe there's rumors that they talked about only bringing all sports except for football. Do they just give up on football? I, I don't see them taking a lesser cut to join the Big 12 and then g- cutting football. Because there was a rumor that they might try to force UConn to do that and then bring in Gonzaga too and have a couple affiliate members to help broad, like really build the Big 12 as the best basketball conference. But I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Florida State's the key. Florida State is the key right now. And so that's where if you're Big 10, you just wait and see. Because like I said, if they, if they add Clemson to Florida State, they're running out of room. Because they want to add Notre Dame, there's no guarantee that Notre Dame is going to take like UNC with them. I wouldn't be surprised if you the Big Ten randomly got Notre Dame and Boston College or something weird. Right? They're like, <laughs> we need a buddy here. A, a lot of people are still hoping that Notre Dame wants to bring Pitt with them. Which I wouldn't be against. Because I, I like the rivalry aspect. Penn State can cut the crap with the unrivaled thing. Notre Dame comes in with Pitt. And then Florida State and Clemson, that's a good 20. You know? Lock down the East Coast. Because you don't want, much like yep. I said, the SEC, you don't want them coming down. or coming. Or you don't want the Big Ten coming down in the South. The Big Ten doesn't want the SEC to start coming up to the North. They already have trouble keeping recruits from like Philly from going to Georgia. If they would randomly add West Virginia and Pitt to the SEC, that's like a dagger going right up to the north. And until they start doing things like that, I, that's why I'm I'm leaning 100% Big Ten. But the SEC is still has some power where if they wanted to grab some of these other bigger states from the Big Ten's recruiting footprint, they could do it. I just don't think they're going to be able to wait and get the top dogs. Anything else you want to add, though? Feel free. I was going pretty long. I mean, I, f- I feel like the everything's just hinging on the the final dollar amount of what it's going to take to get them out. Because you know, like we talked last week, part of this this game of chicken right now is finding a home and hoping that there's going to be a a spot in the big 10 for Florida state, because I would think that you don't even put a toe in the water and, and consider that unless you have a pretty solid backing of what, what the next steps are going to be, you know, as, as far as like they, they moved some money around and they structured some things so that they can afford renovations to the stadium they can afford, you know, to, to cover buyout costs and they, they restructured stuff so that they're in a really good place. But I feel like you don't even, you don't even begin that process because I feel like the absolute worst case scenario would be 
you get out and even if there is a 200 million dollar buyout it's less than it's less than the half a billion that you thought it was going to take but then you don't have a landing spot you know if the big 10 isn't isn't serious about taking you and you can't get into the sec you you, you jumped out of one bad situation into a potentially worse well that's why i brought up some of the big 10 stuff did you see that Fox, for like one of their streaming things, like they're only going to have start to have postseason tournaments where it includes like basketball teams from their conference getting auto bids, like the Big Twelve, the Big Ten, the Big East, and someone else. Maybe it was only those three, but I'm wondering if that's going to be the future where you have kind of like an invitational as a way where if Florida State. I really don't see the Big Ten turning them down. And if they do, they'd be very short-sighted, especially after they they took a gamble on Nebraska. I know Nebraska hasn't worked out yet, but they still have the hype train. Right every year we have to hear about how Nebraska's almost back. It's like listening to Tennessee fans, man. So we have that going. Take a gamble on Florida State and then start to do like extra... Um, Fox interconference challenges with the Big 12 where you're having like Oklahoma State play like Florida State to kick off the season and then you're cutting out the SEC but they're like featured games on Fox or CBS or NBC I think you're coming close to a reality where it's kind of like the Big 10 ACC challenge kind of just got cut but now it's like an SEC ACC challenge on the ESPN doesn't get as much hype because no one really cares about SEC basketball. Big 10 and Big 12 football, I mean, I don't know. There's still some Pac-12 rivalries in there. Just bring those back for like a pre-football season challenge where it's like Arizona and Utah, like Utah, USC or something, Arizona playing like Oregon. And it's like, oh, it looks like Big 10 should have the advantage here, but maybe they don't. Maybe it's enough to get the Big 12 an extra auto bid, not auto bid, but like an extra playoff team. Where if you start to do that and the SEC has no repercussion because the ACC got gutted with teams flooding to the Big 12 and the Big 10, then like I said, I I feel like at that point the SEC would have to be on borrowed time. But it's happening faster than what everyone says. Um. But that leads me to the next topic, or the big one today. Uh, I put on here, Caitlin Clark, greatest of all time, women's basketball player. Hands down. She brought in so many TV viewers for people just wanting to watch her shoot the ball from, like, half court. That it was the (laughs) most watched women's basketball game probably ever. I don't even know. Maybe back to, like, the day when there was only, like, three things on TV. Um, recently it's beaten all the men's basketball and NBA games, Matt. The only thing that it hasn't beaten sports wise were NFL, college football, and the Olympics. That's it. And I'm talking about like that playoff game got a many view, like got a little bit more, I think, than what Ohio State Michigan did this year, which is an insane number. And I think it has to do with ESPN putting it everywhere. Like, yay, we want you to stream it on ESPN plus. We wanted, I don't even know if it was on ABC, but they really wanted people to watch the game and it worked. And my feeling is those numbers aren't going to stay up. Those numbers are going to fall because without her jacking up threes, what I watched in those games, because I tuned in to watch her play and I was hoping she would pull it off. And all I saw on the broadcast were like a bunch of bitter UConn players. It just cracked me up. It's like they were talking about how some UConn player from like 2013 should be considered the greatest of all time because she won like three national championships. It's like, yeah, but you you went to the Alabama of women's college basketball. Everyone knew UConn was going to be the preseason number one. Like, how is that the greatest of all time? Caitlin Clark went to Iowa. (laughs) Iowa has no chance to win the national championship other than wrestling, right, for most sports. This girl came in, elevated that school 
to two Final Fours and two runner-up appearances where it looked like if they had, I mean, it, it just came down to the South Carolina was like twice the size of them. And I, 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 I said that last week on the show that I think it's going to be bad for NC State. It's going to be bad for Iowa because like you have teams that are just bigger and it's going to look like a high school team versus JV. And credit to them, Iowa kept it close. Till the end when you could tell she was tired and the shots weren't falling and she was making like some uncharacteristic mistakes because she was tired because they were like constantly all over her. And that's what happened last year too. Except last year they caught a bunch of BS fouls on her. And so I almost wonder if they would have fairly officiated the game last year, would they have won the national championship? They beat LSU this year. They did beat L- South Carolina maybe last year. But like that one player was six foot seven. She was so much bigger than everyone else. She had countless blocks. It was like watching Purdue play. Um, it was a team that they played before NC State because that's why I said that guy had like eight, or maybe it was UConn against someone. They had eight blocks in a row. Oh, it was Illinois. I said Illinois couldn't even score because UConn's guy was so big and they were so athletic that I <laughs> knew that they were going to win the national championship. I had already figured they would, but after watching them throttle Illinois, I knew that. Purdue had no chance. Purdue probably had the best chance. NC State would have had no chance. And then Alabama kept it close because they they went the opposite. They didn't have any big men. But it didn't matter. So that's my thing. With Caitlin Clark, those viewers were for her. We talked about the big three or whatever offering her $5 million. Worth more than that. She brought in like 18 million viewers or something. I think I had the number. I think I texted it to you. Yeah, uh, that sounds right. Because it was like 18.7 million viewers. on It was on ABC and ESPN. And it was most... they had, At the peak, there was 24 million people tuning in. Which is the one thing why I wanted college football on ABC too, because that helps boost the numbers. But comparing between men's or women's, the most viewed since 2019... And women's have never been close to that number. Like they, the most watched women's game was just an Iowa game a couple weeks ago, maybe against LSU, where they got like ten million. And I thought that's a pretty good number because that's like what Florida State and Michigan had in the Orange Bowl that one year. And I forgot to bring it up on the show because I thought if they could bring that level, that's very close to what the NBA Finals bring in for Game Seven. People don't care about games two through six or whatever. They only care about the maybe the opening game and the elimination game in the NBA. And so that's their problem. Where at college basketball, it's like, they only care about Caitlin Clark. She's literally the David versus Goliath. <laughs> because that's what they're playing. They had to beat U- UConn. They had to beat South Carolina. And South Carolina playing like the, oh, woe is us. We've only won three national championships recently. It's like, oh, I was won nothing. They're, they're going to fall off when Caitlin Clark leaves. They're probably never going to get back to Final Four unless recruiting picks up for them. And how was it not because of her? It's like when Larry Bird led Indiana State, the same exact thing. Lost to Magic Johnson in the finals and a Michigan State team that was probably 100 times more talented than what Indiana State was. Right, because Indiana State still doesn't live in a big conference. So how the heck is Indiana State having money when all the rest of the money in the in the state goes to Purdue and Indiana and Notre Dame? Right. That's Caitlin Clark is like the Larry Bird right now, and because of that, greatest. I know Michael Jordan kind of made North Carolina a thing, and now you have all those people like UConn's won six championships since like 1999 or something. All recently. And men's, not women's. Women's, they started like in the 90s too, and they've been on fire. But I don't, I think women's basketball is kind of newer. Doesn't matter. If you want to be considered the greatest, now with the transfer portal and everything, you can go to any school and you can elevate them. Iowa's coach has been there for like 20 years. They haven't made it deep in the tournament ever until Caitlin Clark. It, go to UConn. And it, one of their, was a Dan or Tarazi or something, was like posting pictures of her as a goat and like saying that, oh, we were never even allowed to shoot threes. We had to just make layups. It's like, yeah, that's boring basketball. That's why no one's watching it. <laughs> like, honestly, just say it. That, that's boring as shit. Watching the girls come in and just try to make layups and miss them. 
because they're just like fighting down underneath. At least Keelan Clark was opening up the game. And it wasn't just her. There were other players on the team then that were shooting threes. And I know South Carolina, they had to open it up and they had their freshmen hitting a bunch of threes. And I thought, good. That's the only way the game is going to grow. Like a Steph Curry type thing. Where if a casual person's watching and they're seeing her splash threes from half court, they're going to say, holy man, she could probably beat me one-on-one. Right? I, I want to I watch her and see what she's doing out there. But if it's just someone making layups, man, that's like the record holder said, like, oh, I don't believe that Caitlin Clark has the records because we only had a two-point line in a men's basketball. And I was like, I want to see a shot chart of all your points. Or are you just underneath, like, was it Will Chamberlain or someone just dun- doing layups and dunks? Because you weren't doing dunks, probably. But, like, Brittany Griner, she was so dominant because she was tall. That's it. But I feel like that's you're starting to see some of that shift back because you had the bigger body center from UConn. You had it for Purdue. You had the run with NC state. Like the, you're starting to shift back away from some of those more predominantly smaller guard type forwards. And you're getting back into those bigger, beefier guys. I think it all depends though. Cause I, I was it Alabama. They came pretty close. They didn't really have a big, center but i mean like the smaller schools they're always going to have to do that like for iowa to compete if you're not grabbing someone that's six foot seven to match up against a south carolina girl there's no way you have a chance unless you're running the ball where you're just constantly moving and trying to tire her out and i mean there were questionable calls i saw people say like i wish the game was fairly officiated like this year it wasn't egregious to me it just looked like they got tired where last year when they were per- like, it looked like they were trying to foul Caitlin Clark out on purpose, like to teach her a lesson. Like that's not how we play women's basketball, shooting the ball from deep. And it's just weird because it's like, that's the only reason people are watching. I saw a couple articles. It was like, can they keep the momentum? It's like, I wonder if the WNBA is going to keep the momentum. And I already saw a couple coaches say like, we don't know if that's going to fit in our system. It's like, then don't draft her. It's, it's like the NFL quarterback thing. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, that run spread's awesome. Like, you can run the ball at the quarterback, do all this stuff. Oh, that won't work in the NFL, though. We need, like, we need a guy that's like a statue, like a Drew Bledsoe. That's what we like. And then when Mahomes came out, people were like, oh, my gosh, how's this working? <laughs> and now everyone's, like, trying to find a Mahomes, but he's still not running the ball. Like, Hurts is be the opposite of, like, we're going to run the ball and try to get guys. But it's like, when Hurts has backups that, like, don't even fit that style, it's almost, like, head-scratching to me. Like, when they bring in Kenny Pickett, it's like, Kenny Pickett is not a Jalen Hurts-type quarterback. He, uh, <laughs> like, what are you trying to do? That's what I feel like with Kayla Clark. They're going to be, like, they're going to tamp her down. And then maybe she's better off just playing in the big three. And I, I think at this point, I wonder almost, like, if she would join the big three... And not playing the WNBA and just saying, like, no, nah, I don't want that cheap salary. Uh, why, why do you have to play in the WNBA? You don't. They're not going to help you. Like, it's not like you get promoted in the WNBA. Um, so just play the big three, collect your money. They play less games, probably. You're not having to do all these like forced extra publicity type things. And if she's good there, and what if she brings eyeballs? To where, like, because I think the big three you compete against men. I don't even know if there's a woman quota, right? Because I think some of them it was like two guys and a girl, and that w- that was like the team. But if you if you had to do that and you had her on your team, you would have to have an advantage, I would think. I would think so. If she's winning the championship there every year, and they're bringing in tons of eyeballs just to watch her, I feel like that would have to crush the WNBA. It's almost like where the USFL and the XFL were kind of split. Now they join and they try to keep their two best teams together. And the TV ratings kind of went down because I talked about it last week. It's like they pick teams, but they didn't really, they pick them thinking like, oh, this is going to be like when the ABA and the NBA merge, where we're just going to take the best teams. There's no history with the USFL and XFL though. Like the history is like from 30 years ago. 
and then they had one season. How do you know those were the best teams and the best owners? Like, they could have just been lucky. So, like, uh, just picking the best teams instead of trying to do rivalries, like I've been saying, is a bad move. And so, that's where, like, the WNBA, if they could bring her in, I feel like Caitlin Clark's going to be, like, the bad guy. Because I think everyone in the league is going to hate her. Like, the girls that were doing the broadcast, they were all crying when South Carolina left, Matt. And when they won. Did you see the game? They were all so pumped that South Carolina had won that it was <laughs> like, it's like watching, because everyone cheers against Michigan. Uh, I found an all 22. Someone put an all 22 of the Rose Bowl up on YouTube, and I've been watching it. And the first thing the ESPN announcer said was like, the entire Big Ten is pulling for Michigan. And I'm like, they are not. My man, I hate to break it to you. <laughs> they want us to lose. There was Ohio State guys at the game that had like Ohio State fans cheering for Bama. They bought shirts that said that. Like, that's how insane some of these people are. Like, I know ESPN doesn't get it. No one was cheering for Michigan to win. And I, I think all the pros and all the... WNBA media people, they were cheering for Caitlin Clark to lose. Cheering for her. I think there was might have been one player that I saw the whole weekend that had something positive to say about her because she's already more popular than all of them put together. None of them have ever had a, someone, 18 million people watch their games, Matt. Not one of them. Right? They're jealous. That's it. Greatest of all time. Well, it's harder for them to preach their their political stuff because she's from from what the interviews have shown, she's been pretty conservative, like white woman that doesn't have a female partner. It's like all the things that normally ESPN would be like gobbling up. They don't have any of their usual anchor points to to draw from. I think one of the funnier things I saw is she should just come back next year, make another like fifteen million in NIL, graduate, and then just retire. Just be done after that, and not have to try to deal with any of the drama going to the WNBA. Well, can't she go back? I was wondering that because with the COVID year, right? I thought I would think she'd have one more year, unless she's like super old, like a Blake Corum, where it's like it's well, no, there's got. Like figuring out ways to get extended circumstances. Hey, isn't Michigan's backup quarterback a seven or eight year? <laughs> it's like who who knows? But that that's what it, that's the one thing where it was like last year. I, I saw a lot of Big Ten fans were kind of pushing for her in Iowa to kind of get some big transfers. They're like, get some, get, you need a big forward. What are you doing? And they didn't get it. And that's why I think a lot of people kind of wrote them off. They were like, yeah, we know that you, what you needed last year. You didn't get in the transfer portal. You're not winning at all. And it's almost like, yeah, just come back and win the NIL. Like the State Farm one is kind of what I've been saying all along from experience. Like if you're an athlete, most of the time, you're not going to be getting like State Farm per se, but you're going to be getting ads from like lower local i want to say like lower lower cost or whatever but like local tv ads that usually don't cost as much you know from like local car dealerships i keep seeing one about one of the north carolina guys down here that play basketball he's like doing an eye commercial for like a local eye clinic and i thought that's what women's basketball kind of needs but i was talking to someone that works in athletics and what they were saying is and this isn't at one of the schools I usually talk about. But what they were saying is that if you look at what Michigan did in football, the NIL money comes in and the collective's like, hey, donate to us. We're going to decide where to put the money. Holy crap. This is one of national championship. I guess all the money needs to go to football. We can keep winning national championships. Are you serious? So then all the money for the other sports kind of dries up. Where it's like, football is going to be the top dog no matter what. If you have any semblance of success, you're going to have people in the NIL that keep pushing for money to go from basketball or whatever else to go to football. 
And maybe schools have enough where they can kind of spread it out or they'll have a donor that's like played a different sport like tennis or something. And they, they specifically want one of those athletes to kind of prop it up. But they were telling me that it's only been a couple of years and they're already seeing the money shift and dry up for some of those Olympic sports where you're seeing a bunch of people on the transfer portal and people were kind of like, that's random. Like, why are you joining the transfer portal? You were playing like a lot of minutes. They're trying to get NIL. They're going to regret their decision because no school is going to be able to deliver on what they promise because it's an arms race with football leading the pack and then men's basketball and then everything else under that. Where some schools can be like, oh, maybe we'll do it here for like baseball. Maybe we're a wrestling school. Like in Iowa, I brought up earlier. Like if I could start winning wrestling championships against Penn State again, maybe that's where they kind of draw the line. And they're like, the Caitlin Clark thing was fun, but we still couldn't win the championship. Why am I sending money to the women's basketball team? Like how am I competing? And it only takes one donor. Because, like, they were telling me that from what they know at their school, which is a D1 school, um, that the money coming in to, like, split up between the other sports is almost like nothing. Like, a lot of, they're saying that a lot of athletes are going to kind of regret pushing for this instead of pushing for what the Big Ten wanted, where everyone kind of gets a salary. Or I guess just Jim Harbaugh wanted that, right? (laughs) It's like, (laughs) that's probably why they hated him. Because you can't convince me otherwise that they just had a witch hunt for Harbaugh when he went to the NFL. We've heard, like, nothing. Like, the NFL's eating it up. They're having stories about Jim Harbaugh every day. About how he, he likes living on the beach. About how... What was the one you sent me today? About how he took the players' uh, names off their lockers and put their recruiting ranking or something. It's like they're just, like, ready, ready to write articles all about him. And if you, if you don't believe what I'm saying, look at John Calipari. There are rumors, I think, I don't know if we joked about it on the show, if it was in the pre-show, but I said that there, there was smoke where he might be interested in Michigan, and it came out that not only was he interested in the Michigan job, he also had put out feelers for Ohio State when they were talking about just doing an internal hire. He was like, wait a second, I might be interested if you guys want to open it up, and ultimately they didn't do it. Now Arkansas comes in where he's like, look, Kentucky. He, and I, uh, I mean, I, I'm not for or against him. People say that he's like sleazy or whatever. He kind of laid it out in his Kentucky thing saying like, look, I like to develop freshmen to go to the NBA. Winning is a part of that, but sometimes the way I do it is going to be hard. Like it's going to be hard because I'm not like trying to get grad transfers in. And he seemed like he was throwing shade at other schools like UConn that kind of had their backfill like that, where their whole front court was transfers, I think. Where it's like, yeah, I could bring transfers in that have experience and try to Frankenstein a team together. But he likes coaching high school kids and trying to get them to the NBA. And Kentucky fans didn't want that anymore. And I don't blame them because it wasn't getting results. Because how are you going to play? And I wonder if it's some of it short-sighted too with the COVID year we talked about. Was he struggling because he was playing against guys that were like 25? Right? Because he's only struggled recently. Someone told me the last three years were really bad for him. I was thinking, yeah, he's playing guys that are 25 or 26. That's not that's going to end soon, if it hasn't already. If the NCAA quits telling people they could play for eight years. So, that's where Arkansas might get a steal. Because if they're able to come in and then their NIL can get a transfer or two... Or heck, at, at Arkansas, are there guys really going pro after one year? So what if he doesn't get the number one class? What if he gets the number six class, but they stay for two or three years? I don't know who K- Kentucky's going to hire. And you know what's even funnier? SMU started this whole thing. SMU hired USC's coach because he didn't want to coach in the Big Ten. He was like, yeah, I, I, I prefer ACC basketball. It's like, yeah, no crap, buddy. No crap, I wouldn't want to play in the Big Ten either. Big Ten's gigantic, and they're throwing money everywhere right now. So then he leaves. <laughs> USC hires someone else's coach, right? And then eventually, uh, they take Arkansas's coach. And then, of course, Arkansas's like, oh, crap. 
Um, we'll go ahead and grab Kalapari because he's at, he's telling everyone he wants a new job. So we can get him. Very easy. And like, what if Louisville would have got him? That would have been even funnier. And now we're going to see if it works out. It's almost like, I don't even know how to put it in perspective of him leaving. It was almost like Brian Kelly going to LSU, but that's not even in the same conference. Like, have we had a coach that was at the top program? It'd be like if Ohio State's coach was like, you know what? Ryan Day, he's like, you know what? Quit making fun of me, guys. I wasn't born on third base. I'm going to teach you guys a lesson. I'm going to go coach Illinois. And everyone would be like, what the hell? <laughs> What's he doing? <laughs> I mean, because, like, I mean, I actually, it probably would have been more akin to what? Minnesota, maybe? Because Minnesota had historical success. Arkansas has had success back in the 90s, right? I don't think they've had basketball high level success since. They've been kind of close, but that's kind of similar where it's like, you were at Ohio State that had the most resources, kind of like Kentucky football or Kentucky basketball. And then you just took a job that used to be good. But I might have NIL guys saying, like, if we can get a top coach, we can be back to our glory days. That's kind but of I, what I, happened there. You know, I do feel like you you look at – and for for being a, a pretty proud program, to, to see the difference in resources going from Kentucky to – Arkansas is insane. But see, that's where some of it, though, I wonder if it's like just poor favor. Because like I saw it when, when Juwan Howard, where he had his incidents on the court. And I mean, honestly, after that, he lost a lot of support inside the Michigan um, boosters, right? And so even though he had support, it was kind of like, we don't know if we're going to give you 100% because you embarrassed us by slapping that Wisconsin coach. And so ever since that incident, it's been downhill from him. And then all of a sudden, Dusty May comes in. That's why I told you. I, was like, I hope that Kentucky doesn't try to hire him. Um, He comes into Michigan. And next thing you know, there's new NIL stuff all set up. So it's like, was it the coach not pushing for NIL? Because he, I, I've heard John Howard complain about it a few times where he wasn't getting support. Or were they just... He lost favor inside the boosters. I think that's what happened with Calipari. They're like, look, Duke's not having the drop off with a new coach that we're having. And you're saying it's because of NIL. How is Duke better than us? And that, that has to be 100% what they're looking at. Because you look at UNC, you look at Duke. They both had new coaches recently during the NILs type stuff. And they're still better than what Kentucky is. And I think that the boosters were just like, look, we're done. And he knew it because, I mean, he meets with them all the time, right? He has to do, like, his appearances. So he knew it was going to be bad. And that's why I think he started to look for other gigs, like, that he knew had potential. And hopefully he would be able to bring in guys. And I think he, I think specifically, if he's looking at Arkansas, Michigan, and Ohio State, I think he was looking at big-name programs that don't have to deal with guys leaving for the NBA early every year then maybe if he can bring in a couple of recruits and he's getting a top recruiting class, because that's the issue with like Alabama football versus like what he had at Kentucky basketball. Kentucky had too many one and dones. That's what Jawan Howard's issue to at Michigan was. He had too many guys going pro that weren't ready. And it's like, keep them. Who's giving these guys bad advice whenever they're not getting drafted? Um, I saw the same thing with when Harbaugh came too. He had a bunch of guys leaving early all the time the first couple years. And then guess what? That stopped. And then they won the national championship. So Alabama didn't have guys leaving early. And if they did, they were already ready to backfill. That's You have to have a mix. You can't just be all one and done like Kentucky was. Because when they made their deep runs, they always had a couple guys that were in the upper class. Um. But I don't know. I, I don't know how people are going to, how, how they're going to feel going forward. Because, like, I feel like with the college basketball, if the women's game is bringing in more viewers because of a change in pace and a big time player, what's going to happen with college basketball? Are they going to start hyping players up now instead? Trying to get people to tune in for single people? And with the transfer portal, 
that just spells like a recipe for disaster for me. I don't know. Well, I think they, I think you're kind of seeing the impact that one player can have, you know, because with, with all of this hype in last year, I felt like there was, there was more with the angel Reese as well, that they started having these, these single highlighted players and putting such an emphasis on it that it, it drew the the TV crowds to it. And I feel like that's kind of the direction maybe that they're looking to go where they can highlight these individual players and maybe build the storylines as they go. <laughs> it's like double, uh, WrestleMania that just happened, right? I had, a, I had someone argue with me. They were like, I'm like, I, I can't really watch wrestling. I know it's all scripted. And they're like, yeah, what's the difference? It's like an art form. Yeah, but I don't go watch musicals either, buddy. The same thing. And they're like, you know what's real? When they throw a guy and he hits a ladder. I'm like, yeah. I, I get that. But I don't know, like the scripted part. Cause like, and to push my point, every ad I saw for it was about like dudes working out, trying to put in their time so they could find, they finally had enough strength to be the champ. And I'm like, th- working out has nothing to do with the buddy. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? We know it's scripted. Like, who's this for? I'm like looking around every time I saw an ad because there was like a new wrestling thing that came out too. And every time I was watching the college basketball, they're having wrestling ads, and it's all about people working out hard, trying to prove themselves. And I'm like, isn't it just like taking better acting classes? Who the crowd likes better? <laughs> like working out like some of those guys aren't even in shape big van vader mankind it's who the crowd likes man they're like bringing guys back like undertaker and people are going crazy um i did see someone in the crowd had a sign that was like ohio state hasn't beat michigan for like thousands of days <laughs> which i thought was funny at a random wrestlemania because you know a lot of ohio state fans are watching wrestlemania dude <laughs> so they were probably like super pissed, like watching it. Like, are you kidding me? I can't believe it. Cause I saw it trending a bit and I'm like, they have to be pissed. Why else? Why else would that be trending? Um, but that's kind of like where I'm at with like some of the basketball stuff too. Cause like with Kayla Clark, they hype it up, hype it up, hype it up. There's no scripted ending. So she loses and she's done. It's, it's like, how many times are you going to do like a boy cries wolf where it's like, this next person's the greatest thing. Look, they have like so-and-so team being number one. Like, you can't hype me up to watch someone play at UConn or South Carolina at this point. It'd be like what, getting hyped to watch someone at Tennessee back in the day when Pat Summit was there. Or even Ken Milky's team or whatever, and they had that hit piece on her that she blew up for no reason. It's like, why? I, I'm not going to watch that. What are you doing? <laughs> Give me a good sporting event. I don't want to see ref ball. What was it? UFL? I'm watching UFL, dude. I texted you because they do a replay. And I'm like, oh, I wonder what they're replaying, you know? Dean Blandino is standing there. I'm like, I want that guy's job. He's literally just repeating what he's seen on TV. Like, yeah, he got stepped on on the 15-yard line. Right there. <laughs> I, I'm pointing at it right here. And they had the camera. Him point at the TV of the guy's foot on the 15 yard, 15 yard line. I'm like, buddy, I can already see that. And there he was like, yeah, I called in a penalty. He, he called in the replay to give a team a full start. And I thought, I don't want more replays and especially not for penalties, like a full start because the guys on the crowd should see that. If you're going to replay penalties, I want to see it to be like when a guy um, face masks or something and he doesn't actually face mask or he does face mask something really quick, not doing a false start and then taking the ball back and then having to reset the sticks. It added so much time. Like if you're going to do it in the booth, there are some of the, like the helmet, the helmets, I know they replay those, but like a face mask is hundred percent. I see it missed a bunch of times watching a bunch of college football and it is a player safety thing. Cause the guy's head gets like ripped off. And they never replay it. They never call it or do anything. So that's what I want to see for my replays. I don't want to see false starts. It was almost like they watched that Chiefs play where the guy lined up or whatever. 
And they're like, wonder if we could just fix that <laughs> with a random penalty. That That's how I felt watching the UFL. Plus, ESPN had a like a three-inch uh, stat line at the bottom. Most of it was white. And I thought, why are they doing that? Why don't you just put it at the very bottom of the TV? Like, are they thinking people are watching on CRT? T- I, even if it was a square TV, the score would still fit. I don't understand why they had it so high. It was like, you know what? We don't want people to actually see a lot of this game. Or my thought was, are they hiding how empty it is there? And they're like, if we make the score car, score bug or whatever they call it, if we make that three inches, oh man, no one will even be able to see the crowd. And the guy's like, got it, do that. Do that right now. <laughs> Just put some white there, pop that up. Then the camera guy can angle it down. You'll never see the crowd. And then we'll just pop in random shots of people in the parking lot or something. And that's probably what they did. Because that's the only reason I thought, why else would they be cropping this, this game footage so tight? For no reason. Just for the scoreboard that's white. Uh, maybe I should take a picture next time if I see it. I'm sure there's some YouTubes. Maybe I'll take a screenshot, put it on my Instagram. But I think that's all I had today. I, like I said, I knew we wouldn't go. An hour. Let me just check my show notes. Um, anything you want to add in? No. I, I think we we hit a well-rounded show tonight. I know. I, I'm excited about the UFL, like I said. Ratings dropped. They're underneath a million per game. And I wonder like, how like it's hard to get people to watch when women's basketball is drawing in, whatever. I did watch the game going in. So what did I do? I watched a game on Saturday. I can't remember which one, if it was early or late. And then I watched the one leading into the uh, women's basketball final, which I think is the one that had the gigantic scoreboard, if I'm think- if I'm remembering. Um, let's see what else. Kalapari, 22, I had that. The other lawsuit stuff we kind of already hit on. The one other thing is that, uh, I know we really don't talk political stuff, but the NI. A or what is that? N I A I. Where did that text go? I sent you. Yeah, the N A I A, which governs small colleges, announced that they're banning transgender athletes from women's sports, which was something that was kind of came up at the end of the South Carolina championship, where their coach was like, "No, I I wish they would play." And someone was like, "Well, someone posted like, if a six foot seven center." is dominating what would make what would be the difference if like lebron or someone of his size he would be so much bigger just skeletally right that i i I would just have a hard time thinking that that would be fair well just how many videos do you have to have of a guy identifying as a woman absolutely destroying the, the naturally born women in competition. How many times do you have to have that show those videos shown before you're like, there are structural differences. Well, that's, that's the one thing that I've been saying, like right now you can say I'm crazy, but the difference in women's basketball is 100% size. Iowa had skill that the other teams did not have. With Caitlin Clark. And at the end of the day, that can win you games. But looking at their record, they weren't undefeated. They had lost like three or four games throughout the year because you can't always shoot the ball 100%. But size can be undefeated. And if you're a foot taller than everybody and you're able to block five to ten shots per game and get every rebound, that's what UConn was doing. They got like every rebound against Purdue because they did exactly what happened with the team last year where... They just focused all their energy on Zach Eady in the paint, got all the rebounds, and then on offense, they kind of just let him do whatever. And it wasn't enough. Because like even at the end of the game, I was going, I was I wasn't even cheering for Purdue, but I was infuriated that they weren't even trying to get back in the game because they didn't take any three pointers. It's like, guys, what are you doing? Like, you know that they're scoring two pointers with their big guy. And you're just going to Zach Eady and getting two pointers. You're not getting any closer. And I, I don't really, I didn't look at the attempts. I don't think they, I don't even remember them even attempting a three pointer down the down the last three minutes. And that's 100 percent coaching. 
And it's bad strategy. Like, what are you doing? You're not fouling. You can have the big guys, but it doesn't matter. Like, what do you, you're down like 10 points. Hit a couple threes and get, if you hit two threes and get a stop, you're down to like five or four points, whatever, depending on free throws or something. That's it. You're back in the game. And they were like, we're not shooting threes. We're just going to keep driving to the hoop. And, and we want this game to end. And they end up losing by like 15 or whatever the score was. And I was just like embarrassed. And that's my thought with like having people that are just bigger. And at some point it's kind of like, oh yeah, it was fun watching Andre the Giant fight all those other people. But I can only watch it like one or two times, right? Unless it's on VHS and then it's at your house. We have to watch it a hundred times, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but that's all I have. You anything else you want to talk about? No. All right. Like I said, let me know if there's any issues with the feed. I'm thinking Spotify is is definitely based on my testing going to allow the downloads to go a lot faster. So I'm very excited um, with this new opportunity for the show to grow. And thanks for listening. Make sure you subscribe. Then we will see you next week.